The Arabic word Sharia literally means way or path, but what it normally means in context is the Islamic law. This consists of legal rulings about how exactly to apply the principles of the Quran and Hadith. And it's a law in the most complete sense of the word. It includes subject matters that we would call law, but also ethics, and even manners. It's all-encompassing. The traditional Islamic outlook is that preaching and persuasion are not enough to improve public morality. Persuasion alone is not going to bring people into full conformity with Sharia. People need an Islamic state to enforce these practices. To be a Muslim, or to be a good one, you must accept these rulings as binding. Islam is really all about conformity with Sharia. Islam is like Judaism and many other religions in this respect. It considers practice to be more foundational and more central than belief. The beliefs are important, but they're fairly simple, whereas conformity with Islamic law is not simple, at least if you're not born into the system. There aren't really any clergy in mainstream Sunni Islam. There are no priests or bishops, and there aren't any religious orders like monks or nuns. There are some orders, though, in the Sufi traditions. While there aren't really clergy, there are religious leaders. And the leaders are the religious scholars. They're men who have been trained in Islamic jurisprudence. Islamic jurisprudence is training in Islamic law, understanding the kind of arguments and reasoning they use, being able to apply those principles to new situations, familiarity with the traditions of interpretation, they get this training, and not only religious training, but training in other matters as well, at religious schools called madrasas. Traditionally, this class of people, the religious scholars, has a strong influence on the wider community. This varies, though, very much by country nowadays. They can either be very influential, helping to lead the country, or they can be marginalized. The community of scholars, the ulama, in most nations, take the view that what they say is what the consensus of the ummah says. So remember, Sunni Islam has as its final authority the consensus of the community. But it's not just what any old ignorant person thinks. The consensus of the community is best expressed by what its community of scholars thinks. And it's important to at least be aware that there are different traditional schools of legal scholarship. This map shows you where they're located. This map is nice. It has in the cooler colors, green and blue, the different Sunni schools. Notice there's one that covers Southeast Asia and also parts of Africa and some other areas, Shafi'i school. Notice also that there's one for just Saudi Arabia. That's the Hanbali school. That's the most conservative school of Islamic jurisprudence. You could say the most restrictive. The Hanafi school, the one that's in slightly lighter green here, is probably the most prevalent overall among Islamic societies. Notice it covers India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Syria, parts of Iraq, Egypt. And the second most dominant is probably the very widespread Maliki school. So on the ground, so to speak, in everyday practice, you're going to find some bigger and smaller differences in the practices in various areas. Also notice the one school that goes all over Iran and part of Iraq. That's the school of Twelver Shiism, the Jafari school. One controversial aspect of Sharia is traditional laws relating to dhimmis. Although the Quran forbids forced conversions, members of other religions are never part of the Ummah. In traditional Islamic societies, they are dhimmis, which means protected peoples. And frankly, that's a euphemism. They're protected in that they're allowed to remain non-Islamic and to basically practice their religion within society. But there's a downside. At first, the dhimmis were only peoples of the book, Jews and Christians. They seem to be rather privileged over other non-Muslims in the Quran. The reason is that their religious views are very similar. And also, Muhammad was trying to win them over for a good part of his career as a prophet. Later on, dhimmis could be people of any other religion. But the downsides were pretty steep. First, they had to pay special taxes. And these could in many cases be quite oppressive taxes. Taxes enough to keep the community poor. And the following things were forbidden. Trying to convert Muslims, you could say proselytizing, marrying Muslim women, holding high government positions, building new churches or synagogues, sometimes also repairing or expanding existing ones, wearing the same styles of clothing as Muslims, testifying in a court of law against any Muslim, and sometimes also they would ban certain public rituals that Muslims found annoying, ringing bells, having processions, public display of banners or crosses or icons, 
Sometimes dummies were forbidden from riding a noble animal, like a horse or a camel. They would be stuck with donkeys. In most cases, conversion to Islam was easy and would immediately lift all or most of these restrictions. There were a few cases where that wasn't so. That's when the government had become dependent on a large dhimmi tax base. It needed to exploit them for their money to carry on government business. Does traditional Islamic law enjoin religious tolerance? Sort of, but in this sense. It's a special type of tolerance, which is brilliantly designed to pacify the people and to basically starve out the religion over time. As time goes on, the community's poor, their buildings are crappy and small, you can't have certain jobs, you have a hard time maybe finding a marriage partner in your own little community. People surrender to the conquerors and are happy that they're allowed to practice their religion. But then, several generations later, it's 99% Islamic. This is all to help you understand how it is that Islam spread through all these conquests. They would grant a basic tolerance to pacify the conquered, but this is an almost infallible recipe for turning a country from 90% Christian or 90% something else to 90% Islamic, and it's worked many times. And we should also make the point that it wasn't all force. Of course, some people are just persuaded by Islam. Some people find its simple message more believable than other religions or they're impressed by the lifestyle of various holy people within it. But you should also know about these factors. In our next segment, the five pillars of Islam. <laughs> 